What's happening, guys, and welcome to our weekly Impact Wrestling Review. I'm Keith, and I'm joined by Ro. What's going on, man? Not much, man. How you doing? I'm doing all right today. Uh, what'd you think of the show last night overall? Man, 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 man. Um, I didn't like anything from the show. Um, you know, normally when I watch Impact, I'm able to find, I either like the whole thing or I'll find a couple of matches or bits. I didn't like anything, and what I told myself is while we review this show, I'll make sure to kind of give my thoughts without uh, giving my own personal opinion on certain mm-hmm. things. But, yeah, and I, I didn't like anything. Oof. Man. Um, no, I thought there was a couple of good things in here. Um, I did like that the episode kind of had the spotlight on the knockouts since uh, – we don't often get to see, you know, four different segments with the women in it, but um, everything was pretty much based around the title pictures. I mean, we saw the tag team title picture spotlight, obviously the uh, world championship knockouts title, and then anything else was kind of cast aside. Uh, I don't know if this really felt like a pay-per-view TV special to me. I mean, we got three matches on the whole show that's less than we generally get week to week so um eh, that's just kind of how i felt i did like the way they opened the show though um they did a really nice opening that kind of made it feel like a big event you know they presented the whole against all odds thing and stuff like that um but yeah we opened the show with uh conan and lax conan says things have gotten out of hand and they can't turn back he calls out the lucha brothers They fight with LAX until security tries to break it up. Both teams take out security. Lucha Bros take out LAX. LAX, I mean, uh, Lucha Brothers go to set up a couple tables. LAX is able to counter and put the Lucha Brothers through the table. Then we see them go backstage. LAX, that is. Conan challenges the Lucha Brothers to a full metal mayhem match at Rebellion. And then later on in the evening, we find out that the Lucha Brothers have accepted this. So, I mean, we kind of expected this match to happen again at rebellion um it's just interesting the simple fact that we've seen eli and eddie building their way up the tag team ranks we still have four weeks to go before the pay-per-view now are they just gonna cast them to the side or just scrap everything now this between these two this would be what match number four right um yeah i believe so yeah because they got we had the match at Rebellion, then the title changed, and they got their rematch, and then they wanted another rematch. Yeah, so that would be number four. Okay. All right. You know, it I, it kind of kind of gives away what's going to happen between Eli and Eddie. They're probably either going to be – well, not they're probably – they're going to be unsuccessful, and then I'm guessing probably feud with one another. You know, um, I think while – the 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 match type I, I i love the full metal mayhem mm. um i'm wondering because there was news out was it this past week that apparently they the lucha brothers might be exclusive to aew um we don't know like i said it's just news it was what only was it? in the states right and then they could work triple a in mexico yeah but yeah. pretty much so you're saying that they could they wouldn't be able to air an impact anymore right so I think if there's some truth to that, then this match makes sense because it seems like anytime, you know, they want a safe bet, they'll put the tag titles on LAX. Um, I get it. You know, it's still weird, the story where you have the Hills trying to, um, you know, want to challenge the faces and the faces are kind of ducking and dodging them. And this is what it took. I would have loved someone else to get this opportunity only because I think it would help, you know, establish another tag team. Because we see now, it's just been revolved around these two teams. Like these other teams that we see facing, whether it is a Eli and Eddie, the Rath schools, um, to a lesser extent, OVE, and then KM and Fala. Like, you know, they're just having matches, racking up wins, and it's not really going anywhere. And then you know, here we see this, you know, LAX, you know, they've been going back and forth. They're really just kind of trading the title, so to speak, should they do a title change at Rebellion. Um, And then on top of that, you know, this is something that we've seen at homecoming. So we're already getting one rematch from a pay-per-view that we had uh, three months ago. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And then the world title match is also a rematch. Um, Yeah. And, and, you know, the thing is, if 
Eli and Eddie doesn't pan out as a tag team. LAX ends up picking the titles up. Lucha Brothers do end up leaving. You have nobody built up to face LAX. It's like even so, like I think with LAX, because we know what we're getting with them. You know, Mm -hmm. great best tag team the company has easily, but they haven't positioned anyone else. You know, they had OVE before they started jobbing the hell out of them. But they had them as kind of like that uh, that one that you could always have some long-term feud between the two teams. But you could easily, kind of like what they did back when they put the titles on Z and E, although I didn't think LAX should have gotten them back from them. You know, it doesn't hurt to have another team kind of, you know, be ahead of the division for the time being. And then when you want to put LAX back in the uh, title picture, you can because they've already established but putting the titles on them, should they go that route and should the news be true? Like, then, you know, you're talking about, you know, them essentially holding the t- titles hostage because, you know, no one else is going to come close to defeating them. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, but, you know, if the Lucha Brothers do stay, I, I think I would like to see them split them up and then. That'll definitely add a couple of contenders there. But, yeah, that brings us back to the tag title picture. I, I, we'll have to see what happens. Maybe we'll get a new tag team coming in or they'll do something. But, uh, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see on that, um, which we end up saying a lot. But uh, <laughs> So up next, we have the special intergender match. Scarlet versus, I'm not going to call him Glenn Gilbert. He's always going to be Disco Inferno to me. Um, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So this was this was interesting the way they uh, they did the match. I mean, first Disco comes out and he grabs a mic and obviously he says that he will give Scarlett one op- an opportunity to call things off. Obviously she comes out and that's not the case. They have the match and uh, we talked a little about this before we started recording and it was just very interesting that you know the way they presented or at least commentary did with Disco getting offense in and just making it seem like he was a terrible person for competing against a woman yet that was the whole point of the match yeah i didn't get that i you know first off you know when i was thinking like with scarlet's character it seems to change kind of week in and week out i and you know what actually i take that back i think it has much more to do with her feuding with a uh, disco like you know she's presented as this person who's you know narcissistic you can say and You know, in this match, it's like they try to make her a sympathetic figure. And I was interested to see how they were going to do this because I I feel like with Impact, they're not fully in on the intergender stuff. I mean, I know they're going to they're having the match between Tessa and Joey Ryan at the United as we stand. But you know, a lot of those one night only, not a lot of them, all of them never really tie into the programming. So I was interested to see how the layout for this match was going to be. I was of the mindset they were going to kind of run where you got the overconfident dude, you know, facing the under underdog in the woman Mm -hmm. and she's capitalizing on all his uh, overconfidence. So whether he's charging at the turnbuckle and she moves out of the way and rolls him up or, you know, things of that nature. But to see him like doing stomps and kicking her and doing all this and that. And then the commentary didn't help because it's like you're essentially making him out to be a bad guy, which I guess he is in this case. Yeah. But. You put him in a match against a woman. What is he supposed to do? And that's a, that. That's the thing with some of these intergender matches. Not all of them. And like, I, I'm not a fan of them. I know there's people that are, and I understand that you can go about it in a way where it's presented, where it seems like a competitive match. But I mean, it just comes it comes to show you. And and I'd be interested to see how many people really were into this. But it just comes to show you, like, for some, like, you know, a Disco kind of held back some, and it, it looked good on on uh, Scarlett's part. Like some mm-hmm. of, I, I thought her hitting that stunner, and then even the finish with the power bomb, I had no problem with that. But I mean, could you imagine if if Disco would have done some of the stuff that heels do, like the uh, um, what is it, the toss to the turnbuckle, oh, or yeah. the snake eyes, or you know, some <laughs> of those moves on on little Scarlett, you know, compared to him, like <laughs> I and I, I don't know, but. Uh, I, I really felt commentary kind of did this a disservice because they made him be out like, you know, what man hits a woman? Like, whoa, what person puts a man against a woman who, <laughs> if he doesn't like men hitting women, you know, so. Yeah, no, I get that. The crowd, uh, 
kind of was a little flat during this. Almost seemed like they didn't know how to react to uh, the events that were going on. I think that's something that you always get with the uh, intergender wrestling. But like you said, um, you know, Disco was going for the 10 punches in the corner, which he called for. And Don was like, why the hell would you punch her in the corner or whatever he said? And then uh, Scarlet ends up breaking his back and hits a powerbomb and gets the win. So uh, the result was expected. Um, I I thought Disco did a a good job in the match, though. He definitely portrayed his character perfectly, which he he has done since he has been around. He's definitely uh, been a bright spot and someone they've brought in that is uh, way past their prime, so to speak. Um, But, yeah, no, I mean, for what it was, it was all right. Kind of be interesting to see what they do now with Scarlet is, you know, I don't know if this really helped her do anything if they're just going to thrust her into the knockouts division. I think what makes it tough is because, you know, not only she's competed on Explosion, but obviously she competes outside of Impact. So it's, I think people might have expected to, like, I know, for example, she does the dis- uh, Canadian Destroyer. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, you know, I, don't, I didn't expect her to do that in this match, but I think people expected to see more. And it was kind of like she was, a, you know, you know, an inferior opponent and she kind of won by the skin of her teeth, which... If that's the story you want to play, fine. But remember, her character is one that's narcissistic. So someone who's narcissistic doesn't really, you know, need luck. You know, their skill alone is going to be enough. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how, what, you know, what's next for her. I really think, given the state of the knockouts division, that's probably a place for her to go. But maybe they feel like it's heel heavy at this moment. So, mm. yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with her. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things we saw with Scarlett was uh, I think she hit the Canadian Destroyer on Trevor Lee back in I don't know the end of last year but that was the big clip going around Um, so we have Melissa interviewing the power couple Ty and Johnny Uh, Ty runs down Jordan she says she's leaving to as champion tonight and Johnny says he's going to enjoy watching cross break the machine Uh, Then we see Glenn Gilberti backstage, sorry, Disco, um, and Alicia and Kiera calling him a loser. And then we see Melissa interviewing Tessa. Uh, Tessa says she has impact by the balls, everything happening to Gail right now. She deserves it. And Tessa says she's going to the ring right now to take her apology. Um, I, I I thought the interview with Tessa was very good. She always just brings that intensity and kind of makes you believe everything she's saying. Yeah, she's well polished. And I mean, you know, she's taking something that, you know, I mean, like I said, obviously she, she'd she be doing bigger and better things. But, you know, she's taking this and, yeah, she's really kind of building building uh, this this feud between her and Gail Kim. Yeah. All right. And then on to probably one of your favorite moments of the night. We had a Madison Rain promo. She's here to settle unfinished business. She calls out Sue Young, Tessa, and Taya. Refresh the knockouts division. Well, I think that kind of dismisses that notion <laughs> where people thought her coming back was to help. I mean, they now have an excuse, you know, given with Ali's departure and you know everyone else, you know, well, whether Tessa's tied up or everyone else, there's really no one clear cut to challenge for the knockouts title. She's she's back. You know, and she's going to try to, what, she's trying to get title number six or number seven? I think it's number six, I think. Number six. So, Maybe. You know, there there you go right there. That's it. She's a woman on a mission. Uh, and then, like we talked about earlier, Lucha Brothers accept Conan's challenge, with, which I think Impact made it official on their Twitter page, right? Didn't I send that to you last night? Yeah. Yeah. And then we have uh, Tessa comes out, and she says she's finally getting justice for Tessa. Gail comes out, Gail apologizes, and, you know, Tessa obviously says that's not good enough, it's time for you to resign. Gail says she gave her resignation to management earlier tonight, and Tessa apologizes for Gail's era of women's wrestling, you know, only being known for bra and panties matches, etc. Um, and then she says Gail couldn't compete in this era, she couldn't lace Tessa's boots. Obviously we knew where they were going. She tell, tells Gail to get lost. Gail says, oh, one more thing. I'm coming out of retirement to kick your ass. Again, refresh the knockouts division. 
you know, where Tessa misspoke was um, Gail being part because I don't think she took part in any bra and panties matches. I think she only had one segment, and it was when she uh, barely had debuted in the E, where she I don't know if she seduced Bischoff or it was something, but it was very early. But you know, outside of that, she's always been presented as a you know straight you know mm-hmm. wrestler. And even in, you know, her work in early TNA and stuff. So I kind of thought she misspoke here. But, you know, with this feud, there's only one way for this to be successful. I I truly believe Tessa not only needs to win, but she needs to win in dominating fashion. Like, Gail Kim, you know, given her accolades and, you know, her accomplishments, like, she's retired. So a retired wrestler shouldn't be going toe-to-toe with someone who's currently active. So... I just really think if they really want to do a, a a a good job in all of this, like Tessa needs to just dominate her because we see these segments and you know it's, it seems like Gail's always getting the upper hand and I get it you know Tessa's the heel and you want the face to be positioned mm-hmm. you know getting the upper hand but come the pay per view man it can't be no fifty fifty I really just think if they did if they went out went out and just had like a five minute match and. Uh, Tessa squashes Gail like a bug I really think that'd be perfect because then you're saying like hey Gail was part of yesteryear Tessa's the now but if you go and have this long 20 minute match where false finishes ref bumps and stuff it even if Tessa gets to win I don't think it's going to help her you know so that's just my thing well we all know that is not going to happen um, which one <laughs> the one where Tessa squashes Gail that there, there's no way <laughs> She is too outspoken for the company and everything like that for that to ever happen. Um, but no, I thought they they did a good job with this segment, at least getting some more heat on the uh, the feud. And uh, I mean, it, it's going to be a competitive match. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> I give Impact credit. Like the one thing they've always been great about doing is, at least in the knockouts division. They're able to build feuds that aren't re- that don't revolve around the title. Mm-hmm. However, I kind of feel like when you're building these feuds, it's good to have people that that are you know currently active in the division because then after that you can elevate them, whether it's the title scene or something else. And I just think like with Gail in this, is this a one off or is she coming back to 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 you know wrestle full time in the division? I, I think there's a a possibility that she's definitely coming back. And see, me too, or at least in a part-time role, just given you look at the division, it I mean, it does seem thin, and I don't know if it's been just the way some of the women have been presented, or it's just we've lost people, like, I don't I don't even think Katarina is a part of the company anymore, but I thought, Probably she, was not. A, I thought she was a body that, you know, you could use and build some feuds for, with, mm-hmm. but yeah, so, you know, you have her, you have Madison, and then, you know, you have the rest of them, and that's pretty much a knockouts division. Well, I mean, what what do they do in this case that Gail comes back for one match only? What are they just gonna put her back to her duties? Like, you know, they have to have a storyline that at least tries to make sense. I just don't know what route they go with it. I mean, it could be kind of like the Tommy Dreamer role. You know how, like, we see with Tommy Dreamer, like he pops up here and there. I mean, oh, yeah. maybe that maybe that's something they want to do with her. Um, but I just think they a part of them i mean it would all be up to gail i mean if gail says hey i'll work part-time and you know hey i don't mind holding the title then you know that's where the booking is gonna go yeah so i guess that's true but i mean you know i i didn't mention this earlier but it, yeah like i said the show kind of was everything that was based around everything that had some sort of feud going on so it was a complete show in that aspect but then you got to think of the rest of the roster that was left off the show and how many people aren't doing anything with, you know, such a small roster, so to speak. I think I looked it up and what did, what did I tell you? They had 30 people total. <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of, even though they only have, if it seems like they got a small roster because we don't know, like I know with the website, sometimes you know, stuff is updated, but I know there was one time they had Bobby Roode up there for, and he had been long gone. Yeah. But, I think they can be getting more out of the roster that they have. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Whether it's a utilization of some of these other shows or anything, they can be getting so much more. But I I get like the way that, you know, they do the tapings there. They bring in certain talents that they know are going to be used for those tapings. But I mean, 
even if it's kind of just backstage segments or, you know, I, you know, the one thing that I, I love sometimes in wrestling, like you don't always have to debut somebody, um, you know, giving them a vignette and, you know, having them appear. You could just have them run in like how they did with Madman Fulton, or mm-hmm. maybe they come out and assist somebody like or manage someone. And then, you know, for weeks we see this, this person accompanying a certain wrestler and you know we get some sort of a background and then you build up you know weeks in and then eventually we see them compete like it doesn't always have to be a vignette it's just like i said they're i feel like they can get, be getting so much more out of the rosters than they do yeah absolutely and speaking about fulton uh we had ove they're shown in the back i guess they were brainwashing him um, but they took him, you know, at a point in his career where it was at a low, and then they're going to bring him to his full potential. So, uh, like we had said last week, I think this is a, the right move to add a power figure to OVE. Um, but we'll see how things go there. Um, oh, and, I, I wanted to make a comment oh, yeah. on that. What I found weird about this was, now, if they would have showed this... Um, last week? <laughs> yeah. And Before then, he like, debuted, say, right? Yeah, and like not show his face or something like that. I think it would have made a whole lot more sense because you would think he was already brainwashed because he came out to assist Sammy. Mm-hmm. So to be brainwashed after the fact, I mean, you know, he was already kind of, you know, uh, had uh, um, the OVE shirt and everything. Yeah, on. he was already yeah. aligned with OVE. So right. I don't know. But I mean, hey, like like I said, I, you know, like I just mentioned, I like different ways of debuting people. And I thought the way they, they debuted him was the right way mm-hmm. um yeah yeah no I, but i think they've done this in the past where it's just segments didn't seem to line up and they definitely could have utilized it earlier on but yeah i agree with you there uh so then we had the knockouts title match tie defending against jordan grace after jordan grace beat tessa for a number one contendership spot a couple weeks back um what'd you think of this match here i liked grace's showing um I'm on board with it. I really think um, if I had to say who's going to be the next big star in Impact, I think it's Jordan Grace. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, management is high on her. Yeah, it does seem a little bit too fast where she is. But given, you know, you you look at the division, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of people for her to face. She pretty much faced everyone. So, you know, here we are. But I really like what we saw. Um, I'm guessing... Well, I'm not guessing. I'm pretty sure the way this match was laid out was to kind of just prolong this to the pay-per-view. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but yeah, I, I really like what I saw with Grace. As far as with Taya, I feel, you know, and we were talking about this online. You know, I think had she been, and I, I know she had went through the character change when she turned face, but I think had she remained the, uh, um, is it like, was it her persona like a Game of Thrones? or Yeah, I, I think I, that's what it, the what they were going for there. Yeah, I think had she stayed that, or resorted back to that as a heel, I think it would click better compared to this whole, because she's essentially the Weta Loca character, but right. she's a heel. And I don't know, you know, the Weta Loca character in other promotions, if that's presented as a heel or a face, but I, I just kind of, you know, that's what I just, you know, find myself. And then obviously we get her faking the injury, kind of like what, you know, Johnny did a couple weeks ago. So, you know, that's just a way to kind of prolong this and push it to the pay-per-view. But I, I really, I liked Grace's showing in this. Yeah. Yeah, it's how, you know, she's got the the catchy theme song, all the bright lo- colors on her gear and things like that. But no, I, I agree with you on that. I think they could definitely change up her look a little bit more because, I mean, even later on you know, when we see Taya, Johnny and Cross, they, they don't kind of, I don't know, line up as a group together. They just kind of look like three people thrown together just by look looking at the three of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, like you had said um Ty ended up missing a moonsault. Jordan sets up for a finisher. Ty ends up gauging, gouging the eyes. Um, and then Ty rolls the apron. We see Johnny come out. He helps her off the apron, carrying her, I think, back. And uh, she ends up getting counted out. At this point, we see Brian Cage come out. He goes after Johnny. Johnny obviously hides behind the alpha, Ty. Uh, <laughs> he gets backed into a corner. And then we see Cross come out, and he takes out Cage. And I thought this segue into the Cross and Cage match was very well done. Except you just kind of had Jordan awkwardly standing in the ring. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would have preferred not to see Johnny come out in this. I, I think, you know, they don't need to be attached to the hip. I mean, obviously they are, but I, I thought you could have done the her faking the injury and then have her kind of walk out on her own and walk out on the match. And then you, know, you give uh, Grace the win by count out or, you know, well, you throw the match out. But I guess since we've seen so much of Ty and Johnny and uh, Brian Cage's feud, we're going to have to see Johnny and uh, Ty's feuds as well. And, you know, that was one of my things, what I didn't like about the show. You talk about overexposure. Like, I mean, how many times do we see Johnny and Ty on here? Like A lot. <laughs> and, I mean, that's not what you need to see. You know, we see this in other companies at times, especially when they have heel champions and, you know, overexposure. And, like, yeah, it was just too much. I felt like I've seen them in every other segment. They were definitely presented a lot on the show. But uh, it is funny. You have, you know, Brian Cage and Johnny Impact, and obviously – the crowd knows which one to cheer and which one to boo. Um, and then you have Cross and Cage, and it seems like the crowd's a little more split there. And then, too, and I know we'll get into the match, but I think what they're doing with Cage, you're trying to build sympathy as this guy who's been screwed. And, I mean, if you really think about it, he hasn't really been screwed out, you know, up, up until most recently. And then, I guess, at homecoming, I... I, you know, some of the storytelling and I get what they're doing and where I, you know, you got to give impact credit on that, but it's just, you know, mind you, they're trying to drag something out that happened in January and carry it out all the way till eight, the end of April, yeah. almost May. It's true. It, it, it is. I, I agree. I got nothing really else <laughs> to say. Um, one thing I, I wasn't a fan of, and I know you were not as well. Um, Cross hits the doomsday Saito on cage and, he kicks out at one. Now, this was supposed to be his finisher outside of the uh, the straight jacket chokehold, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, Which is funny. Uh, go, go ahead. The only thing, you know, the biggest problem I have, and I can't wrap my head around it, and tell me if I'm oh, you know, looking too much into it or not. They seem to always book Cross and Cage where Cross is inferior to Cage. And I can't understand for the life of me because both are big dudes. I know Cage is a little bit more muscular, but even when we see Cage face Moose, like it's they go tit for tat. Yeah. But when he faces Cross, like it's like they go out of their way to kind of make Cross's like offense look so much like shit. Like, why would you have him kick out of the, his finisher at one? Well, you know what I mean? You could have done like a false two or it, I, like it's just everything in it where it's becoming hard. Like and I thought with this match, I thought if they put on a strong showing, you can really I mean, because obviously uh, once Cage wins the title, like I, I'm guessing his first feud would probably be well, second feud because he's going to probably face Johnny again. He would face <laughs> Cross. So you want to build Cross as a credible foe. So when they face each other, it's like, oh, OK. But like I watched this in. I really didn't expect Cross to win at all. Like, just given the way they used right. to have interacted. Well, yeah, and uh, before I bring up my point, what I was going to say, it's, you know, Cage should easily be able to handle Johnny, and, you know, Cross is that factor that, you know, basically helps keep uh, Cage at bay, and I don't know. Yeah, I don't get that vibe either. But, no, what you had said about them protecting the finisher is exactly what I was going to say. Because uh, we saw Brian Cage hit an F5 on Cross, and we see Johnny come out and put Cross's foot on the rope. So I was like, oh, okay, we're completely protecting Cage's finisher, but we're not doing anything to protect Cross's. Okay, I completely see what you guys are going for here. And then to top it off, where I thought, because I, I had, a, um, you know, I unfortunately had a watch on YouTube this week. I had, a, they said he had won, but I didn't see how he won. They gave him a botch finish win. Like, I, I just don't get in. I, I wonder if they book cross the way they do, like, just say like this. You know, if you do cross versus cage, like like you said, the fans seem split and they they really want cage to be the guy. They're putting him in that position to be next in line. Mm -hmm. You know, we we always joke about the coronation's going to happen at Rebellion like in they do it at the expense of cross like they couldn't just give him. Uh, uh, a clean win like even though you have the interference he couldn't have just uh pinned him 
you know, right. it, it wouldn't have hurt Cage. If anything, a, a crosswind helps cross down the road when they want to do cross versus Cage. Now, as much of a fan I am of cross, I don't want to see that match because I already know how it's going to be laid out. They don't book cross as someone who can go toe to toe with Cage. Like no. Cage tosses him around, and you you pointed out best. Cage can goes one on one more with Johnny than he does Cross, and Cross is the bigger guy. Right. Um. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I, I said this to you, but it almost feels like Cage is eventually going to get the Eli treatment. Like we know he should be at the oh, top. Oh, you mean Cross? Should... You mean right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Like Cross is just going to end up floundering at that point. You know, I, I hope I'm wrong at that, but just looking at it and the way things have seemed to progress, that's just the way it looks like they're going to do it. Um. So yeah. As after Johnny comes out, he has Cage distracted. Tyek ends up coming out. She ends up hitting. Brian Cage with a low blow. Obviously, all this is happening behind the ref's back. Cross hits the two Doomsday Saitos. And then Cage looks to kick out at two and a half. But the bell rings and the ref says he counted to three. So the decision stands. And I guess Cage is getting screwed from every angle. Remember, two, he ate two finishers. I mean, mm-hmm. they could have done a roll up the tights or anything. Like, I, it, it just, if I'm a Cross fan, in, which I am, like, I think that's where I'd kind of be a little bit frustrated because it's like, why? This guy is somebody who, you know, these past few months, man, just the work of his character. And even you talk about it like he kind of lives a character even online. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is what you do. You, know, you do to him. And I understand you want to, you know, make Cage look strong or going into the pay-per-view. But, I mean, man, it, I, I just don't know. And I thought I was all like, am I looking too much into this or do are other people seeing this too? I, I, I really think they got a good thing in Cross, and I fear he might end up going the Eli route where, you know, he's, you know, he got over on his own. And, you know, we know sometimes some companies don't like that. And his punishment is, you know, you, you know, they give you some kind of spotlight, but you're never yeah. going to be featured in a prominent role. That's true. I mean, Cross did get a good amount of offense in, in the beginning of the match, um, because he was working on the arm, I believe. And then we saw post-match where Johnny puts a chair around Cage's arm and then hits the other chair, or hits the chair with another chair. But, um, no, you know, and we've said it, like you said before, that the coronation of Cage is going to happen at Rebellion just simply because if Johnny does retain the title, you have no viable options to face him next. Well, they probably just do him versus Cage again. It's going to keep happening until Cage wins. <laughs> uh, you know, like, I, yeah. I wish I was joking, but the, the the thing with this creative team, it seems like when they have a vision or a direction that they want to go with certain people, they're hell-bent on it. Like, there's no type of modifications on the way where, like, just say, for example, they're pushing somebody and they want to push him as a top face and they see the person they're going against is getting more, you know, more cheers and stuff. And then instead they decide, hey, let's push this person like they're hell bent on Cage. I really think if they made Cage take a back seat and went with Cross and say, hey, you had Cross become the champion or whatever. I really don't think anyone would have had a problem with it. If anything, people would have been happy because it's like, hey, here's this guy. We've seen him from day one. You know, he comes in, you know, he's taking people out and, you know, for a little bit he was, uh, you know, aiding Austin Aries and then finally he gets out in his own and he's had a quest for uh, trying to get the title and he finally gets it. And, you know, you could have had Cage versus, versus Cross because Cage, Cage is a sure bet. I don't think anyone thought once they brought Cage on board that he was never going to be world champion. It was yeah. inevitable. Mm-hmm. So with knowing that... You know, you always got that on your back in your back pocket because when he does win, he's probably going to have a long title reign. I could easily see him closing the year out as champion. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. I mean, unless they bring somebody in or they build someone up. But, we, you know, if if the, him being X Division champion was any indication, like, yeah, he's probably going to hold the belt for the remainder of the year. So with knowing that. Give somebody, you know, give some other people a uh, run with the belt. So then once you put the belt on him, he can face these other people. And it's like, at least they have all oh, their former champions, so they're a threat. But, yeah, that, that's just my thing, man. I, I just, you know, and it's nothing against Cage. I do like Cage, but it's just, you know, 
Yeah, we already know he's going to win the title. Right. It's inevitable. You know, yeah. give someone else that shot for the time being. Well, it's funny you bring up the whole former champion thing because we spoke yesterday and I said, how many former world champions are actually still in the company? And we only came up with three, one being Eli, the other being Eddie and then Pentagon. And it looks as if Eli is on his way out the door. And if the whole thing with um, the Lucha Brothers is true and Pentagon leaves, that leaves you with one former champion. And then obviously when cage picks up the title you'll have two with johnny impact but it 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 just it's really really telling and then not only that when you think about it too how many of them have won not only the newer title but while it it being recognized as impact champion versus tna and i know it's the same thing but i'm just saying like that's kind of one of those things like eli's title reign i mean that that seems like such a long time ago same thing with (laughs) it was gfw (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. And, it, you know, it seems like a thing of the past, you know, and they haven't really um, they really don't do enough. I know they might mention it here or there, but the way the, the people are presented, you know, and e- even Eli said in his interview, which I recommend you guys, if you guys haven't heard uh, Dennis Farrell of um, what, what's the name of his podcast? Uh, Wrestling Perspective podcast. Yeah. Like he, he did. He did with Eli. Like Eli made some good points, like where it's not about so much being in. The, uh, you know getting title matches but being in the picture where it's kind of like you know you're still a threat you're somebody that they can plug in but we've seen with Eli they've distanced him further and further away from it Eddie I mean I know Eddie got a, a shot uh, I think against uh, Aries at one point but you know mm-hmm. they distance those guys and you know Pentagon you know Pentagon hasn't been in that room for quite some time so yeah it's just a thing to look at I mean and then, and then the last point I just want to make on it is then, too, you have to wonder where's that. How are you going to able to say just say like Willie Mack, for example, say you wanted to put him in the title picture. How do you get him to that point? You know, how do you bridge him from whatever he's doing to to get to that point? I don't I think there is nothing. They're just going to put him there. And that's and <laughs> bad storytelling. Yeah, and, and I mean, that that's the thing. Like, I think, you know, when you have a guy who hasn't really been doing much and then all of a sudden you dust him off, like, hey, number one contendership match. It's like, what? You know, but... <laughs> it, uh, it's just Couple one of months. Those... Could be those Willie Mack versus uh, Ethan Page matches that turn into number one contendership matches. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and he, he's someone, by the way, too, like uh, Ethan Page. I really think there's something in him if they commit to it, but... I mean, and I mean, I know he's been on like a losing streak. I mean, you can always fix that, obviously. But he's somebody that I really think if they took the time, he can really become their next big star, one of their next big stars. Yeah. I mean, he's done his job on social media, putting over the company. And like I said, he's got a good look. He's good in the ring. You know, there's the potential mm-hmm. there. But will they act on that potential? Who knows? <laughs> All right. I guess we should talk about back to the undead realm. Um, I feel like people are going to be completely split on this. People are either going to love it or hate it. Um, I, I think they did a good, a, a couple good things with this segment. It, it was strange, I will admit. Um, but, you know, they were able to, I guess, write Allie off, which was the whole purpose of this. Um, you know, they did some pretty cool special effects, things like that. Um, they did actually reveal him, who is uh, Kevin Sullivan. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was just uh, a little strange. Now that's the same Kelvin Sullivan, the Taskmaster, right? Yes, yes. Okay. I don't know why I got him confused, and then I there, realized the the other guy was the Shockmaster, the one with the the Stormtrooper who fell through. But that was oh a, yeah yeah ty- typhoon, I think. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I saw a couple people, you know, saying how terrible it was and then people saying how great this was. But uh, definitely interesting because they went to the Undead Realm and ended up in a wrestling arena. I think we're going to call it that. Um, I did like that one guy who... Uh, um, Luchasaurus? Oh, oh, that's his name? Yeah. I, I like him. I was surprised, though. Like, you know, once again, we kind of seen them... And, and I don't know if this is a one-off or if this is something that they're going to do and try to integrate intergender wrestling into Impact. But we've seen in this, like, where, you know, some of those strikes is like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I I think people are going to love it or hate it. 
I'm not going to crap on the people who liked it. You know, if mm-hmm. you liked it, then, you know, that's cool. I, you know, anytime you're talking about killing someone and I think about what <laughs> turned me off, what turned me off with uh, Lucha Underground, because I remember seeing it and they killed someone and I just said, man, and I, I wasn't into it. So, you know, this is no different. You know, I guess this is their way of killing off Alley or Dark our Dark Alley character. Right. But I'm gonna tell you something, and tell me if you if what, what your thoughts on it. You know, the way Rosemary's character is having her cry. Don't you think that kind of humanized her a little bit? Um, yeah, a little bit. But I mean, I guess they've gone through so many things, her and the bunny. So I guess they're, you know, just the connection between the two of them. And this is the last time that she was going to see her. So I, I kind of get it. But I, I get I, your point as well. I mean, you know, if it was something where she broke character and stuff, and I'm just saying crying in the sense of like, man, hey, I've been working with my one of my best friends and now she's leaving. I'm not going to get that luxury. Then I'm fine. I just kind of just think with her character, if, if it had it been Kiara crying, I would have understood it more. But right. I just think with Rosemary's character, I mean. You know, I could see her kind of being like unpleased and maybe depressed or something. But to have her crying, I just kind of just thought like, you know, it made her because she's presented as a, you know, demon. And, you know, to have her cry, demons don't cry. Right, right, know? right. So so I guess that that was just my thing. But, you know, that was her way of writing off Allie. Um, I do think. You know, right now, you know, you're going to have some people who probably look at it like, oh, she won't be missed. She's very re- easily replaceable, mm-hmm. which I get. But she did have a place in the company. I mean, you think back and, you know, I know there's a lot of people who are kind of just pissed off because they felt like she was, you know, talking about she didn't get the opportunities. Um, I don't know what she's referring to. I mean, I right. think she had ample opportunities. If you wanted to say when the new regime came on board. You know, you can you can argue that. But like I said, once again, I'm not trying to speak for her. But um, I really thought she had a place in impact. Um, I think, you know, it was nice seeing her progression and development. And um, I, you know, wish her once again, wish her the best of luck in AEW. I think she'll thrive over there. Right. And, you know, you, you kind of were able to now spin it. So the Rosemary and Sue Young feud that we were we were inevitably going to get anyway, but they kind of lined it up. Because uh, there was a point where Allie was going to end Rosemary and she ends up hesitating. So, you know, they end up fighting back and forth and Rosemary is about to end Sue Young. And that's when Kevin Sullivan's revealed and they have a whole back and forth between him and uh, Rosemary. Uh, So Sue goes to end Rosemary and Allie ends up sacrificing herself. And like I said, that's how they write her off. She changes from... The demon alley to uh, the bunny alley. And um, yeah, so now Rosemary's probably going to get revenge on Sue Young for what took place. You know, if they take their time with that, they can really have something. And I think a few, a few like that, that could help Sue Young because, you know, her character is probably at this time lost and really need to kind of get back because she, you know, during the time, and I know it was a small window when she was at, you know, the height of her career and impact i mean we were seeing some good things and you know she kind of just fell in the background so this is a great opportunity to kind of get her back i i really hope that they give us some more backstory on the whole undead bride thing because they haven't touched upon that at all right no but i think they're too far in where it wouldn't even make any sense i thought that was kind of one of these things and as i mentioned earlier for some people when you're debuting them it doesn't necessarily have to be their in-ring debut right away you could do a couple of uh, vignettes um and i don't think we touched on the one about uh the walking weapon joss alexander but you could do a couple of vignettes of you know telling a story and even if i can touch on the josh one uh real quick yeah go for you know it. You have to be careful with how you present some of these because the the takeaway that I got from watching this is he's going to come in and he's going to be a big deal. And that's why I'm saying at times when you're debuting certain talents, you don't have to debut them all the same. Not everyone needs a vignette. You know, you could do just a run in. You can do they just kind of come out and, you know, maybe cut a promo. Nobody, you know, ever heard of them before. Like there's different ways to debut, debut on backstage. It doesn't always have to be a vignette because I think when you do vignettes, you're giving the impression to the audience like, hey, this is a big deal. 
yeah, this person yeah. is going to be a big deal. And then when they're not pushed as such, then it's kind of like, you know, the buzz is gone. Right. And they could just do something simple as, you know, like you said, have them come and attack somebody out. And then all of a sudden we get a backstory on why these two have heat or, you know, things like that. And you just build something naturally. Like, you know, Sammy and Swan. You had a yeah. backstory there to build everything. And that's been one of the best feuds they've had recently. Yeah, and that's the one I could honestly say, um, and I think that's probably in part, you know, the two things where what made me not like the show was, a, you know, we have this big gap between Homecoming and uh, Rebellion, so I kind of thought having these pay per view like pay per view like shows are important because it kind of buys the time. However, they use this show more to kind of uh, build the storylines to Rebellion that's a month away. But um, and then not only that, you know, we I mean, we got the OVE segment, but, you know, we didn't get, you know, no Eli. Um, who else was missing? No, Eddie. No, Rascal. no Swan. Does he hit yeah. squad? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, some some of the people that have kind of been, Follow. you know, been, you know, been on the show, you know, week in and week out. So I felt, kind of just felt like that. But um but yeah, that that was just my 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 thing. But I don't think we'll get a backstory back to the um, Su Young. I don't think we'll ever get a backstory. I think they're too far along with her character. It's kind of like she's undead bride and boom. That's I mean, it. they could run one. I mean, maybe you know the story they do between her and Rosemary. Maybe they run something where Rosemary kind of dives into that. Right. But uh, um, I, I don't think. I think we're just gonna get a match and boom. That's it. Um. Yeah. So we did get an announcement of, I guess, a departure this week. Uh, Alicia Tout, she's leaving the company after, I guess, she had worked in the, did she work in the backstage interview role in these last set of tapings at Windsor? Or was Melissa there? Or I guess we don't know until it airs. Uh, I think, yeah, she was finishing up. I mean, she was, she initially replaced um, Mackenzie Mitchell. And now, <laughs> months later, um, she's being replaced by yeah. uh melissa santos well we only saw her when they went to canada which was what three different sets of tapings i think in 2018 but uh yeah she had worked all in so i would assume she would probably end up in aew yeah you know it i did find it weird i think once they kind of got away from orlando that was probably the end of mackenzie mitchell Mm-hmm. You know, they're, you know, they're all, the company's all about saving money, which is nothing wrong with that. So it'd make more sense if you're going to be, because at one time it seemed like they were going to be a Canada based promotion. Right. And, and, um, so it makes sense, you know, you have, you know, somebody from Canada because Alicia Tout's Canadian, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure, <laughs> you know, it made sense, you know, to have a resident there, but now that, you know, you know, they're going, you know, moving around and stuff. You know, instead of just keeping her on board, you know, they can have Melissa, who I'm sure probably comes cheap given her ties to, you know, her husband or fiance is on the roster. Um, big loss, of course, of course not. It's an announcer. But I mean, I, I just the thing and I had mentioned to you and I just wonder how some of the talents either currently on the roster or people who might want to be on board. You know, do they have a problem with that? We're seeing kind of like the nepotism you know, kind of going around a lot in impact where relationships are, you know, are prevalent as far as, you know, which roles or, you know, how someone's being, you know, utilized on TV. And, you know, even in the in the regular workplace, you know, when you see stuff like that where, you know, the boss or, you know, somebody who's a supervisor and their wife is the assistant or something, it just, it just kind of is just like a bad sign. With that said, I mean, <laughs> I, with, with with that said, I mean, I'm not saying anything, you know, because as far anything against with them using Melissa, because she's great. You yeah. know, um, the times that I've seen her on Lucha Underground, uh, she's, you know, a great announcer. But I just kind of just wonder, like, do you want to have a company where everyone has some kind of personal relationship? I mean, we always joke, you and I are talking about it's like kind of becoming couples retreat because yeah. majority of the roster is together in some way, shape or form. But um yeah, I mean, until we hear anything, you know, hear anything, like, we'll never, you know, we'll never know. But it just always, I always think back to, you know, when you think about when Aries was on board and all of a sudden that week up leading to Bound for Glory, you know, he started getting into it with Johnny and Taya. And I wonder if some of that came into uh, play 
I mean, we'll never know to this day. We still don't know, but I just kind of wonder. Yeah, it's definitely possible. I mean, obviously he knew the outcome, what it was going to be. So there is definitely a possibility there. Um, I do have a question for our listeners. Um, Ro, you had sent me an article recently about Don talking about their move to Pursuit and Twitch and now bringing an edgier product to Impact Wrestling. And I'm curious to know, we've been almost three months into the Pursuit move, and do you guys feel like Impact has moved in that edgier direction? I mean, me personally, it's kind of been the same old, same old outside of, you know, what we saw with Brian Cage getting bloodied a couple weeks ago and then what we saw in the undead realm last night with the blood and well gore and killing i guess you go can say but i mean i guess that's really all i've seen as far as edgy goes what about yourself bro yeah i uh i haven't seen it it seems like it's the same and i kind of thought even when he was promoting that you know we look back on it now that was just a way to get people to tune in but remember when it started off um, they were doing some of the Charlotte segment. I'm Charlotte. I'm sorry, Scarlet. Scarlet yeah, Scar- Scarlet segments were some of the high higher rated ones on YouTube, and I remember just thinking to myself, like, how far are you gonna go before you know you start turning people off? Like, you know, people don't want to just see a tease. I mean, some not every. I'm not trying to speak for everyone, but someone as attractive as Scarlet, you know, people don't want to see some form of nudity. You know, that's just how <laughs> the way some people are. And you know you're not going to want to go that far. You know, you, she probably is obviously not going to feel comfortable for that, you know, comfortable with that. And then just given where women's wrestling is, you know, that's frowned upon, you know, in this day day and age. So, right. you know, how much are you going to do? And, you know, the blood, I mean, we've seen blood, you know, that's that's not really much. So I, I kind of feel like that was just a way to kind of get people to to watch and kind of sell the idea that, hey, look, you know, um, even though we're moving, we're going to bring something different that we weren't able to pop, to do to on pop. And then, you know, you have some people who say even on Pursuit that they uh, they censor some stuff. There was a the banana segment <laughs> where, yeah. where Scarlet was eating the banana. They censor that. So, you know, if the edginess is you're saying on Twitch, I mean, you can attest to it like. I don't think there's been much. I think, like I said, I think it was just a way to kind of get people, you know, the, you know, people who are down, like, God, you know, they're not going to be on TV. Like, hey, look, or I mean, they're switching to another TV station. Like, hey, look, this is going to be better. Right. That is that is true. Um, You have anything else you want to add? Yeah, question to you and then as well as the listeners. So, um. How many matches do you have to see or how many times of the same match do you have to see before you get fatigued? Um, it's, it's probably twice. I'm not going to lie, man. There's a lot of times where, you know, I see it a couple times and then there's no real interest to see it more. And, you know, the things they kind of can only do things so much. Um, and you know, and WWE has been, terrible at doing that and i'm going to use them as an example like they had the last year for wrestlemania they had booked the aj styles for shinsuke nakamura and made it to be this dream match and stuff like that and i really hate when they book things to be a dream match because it never lives up to the hype but (laughs) they end up beating crap into the ground and you know by the second match i'm already turned off i know that things aren't going to change and stuff like that like the johnny and cage thing i've been pretty turned off of that and the same with the lucha brothers in lax there's not much they can do to keep my attention at this point (laughs) yeah like that was the thing when they announced the full metal mayhem why i get it the match i love that match like how i think what like for me three is enough i think excuse me if you have something where you know, one team wins or one person wins and the other person wins. The third one is a blow off. And then after that, you move forward. Or, you know, if you have one where, you know, you have two matches where one person wins both, that's the end. Um, If you're doing something where it's like a best of seven series, like, <clears throat> excuse me, I can get behind that. You know, that's, yeah, it's, yeah, but that's as advertised, you know, it, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, you're you're preparing for it. But. You know, I just kind of just one, you know, wonder when you're looking at the card of Rebellion, we're essentially getting two rematches from Homecoming. Once again, I advise a pay-per-view that happened three months ago. And between 
during this time, the whole buildup, we still be seeing these people face each other. And I think anytime when you have a match, especially when the first match is great, like it's hard to recapture that magic. So then you end up doing the same spot sometimes. And it's, you know, something that might have been like, oh, ah, you know, got that. This is awesome. It's predictable. Like, okay, I know this is what they're going to do next. So, you know, I just kind of wonder, you know, I seen on social media, a lot of people were on board like, hey, this is awesome. Like, you know, if now if they do this match again, post rebellion, you know, you're still going to feel the same way. Like how many times can they have the same match where you're actually like, OK, you know, can we see see someone else? And, you know, you and me were probably the same as far as like two to three times and stuff. So, yeah, yeah I'm, that's fair. I, I'm just wondering, like the selling point in this pay-per-view, you know, we got, you know, we'll, we'll say four matches because we're assuming that Grace is going to get a rematch against Taya. But, you know, we're getting another Johnny versus uh, Brian Cage match. We're getting another Lucha versus uh, LAX. And then obviously we're going to get the Gale versus Tessa. So I just kind of just wonder, like, you know, for some some fans, I mean, are you okay with seeing people, and not only them, you think about it. <laughs> we've, we've, we've joked about this with Ethan versus Willie. They'll do that every other week. Or yeah. Desi Hit Squad versus the Rascals. Rascals. Yep. I mean, they that even is dragged onto Explosion. I wonder how many times can you see the same match where you're like, before you're like, okay, I'm tired of it. I mean, are you okay with it as long as Impact does it? Or is it kind of like, oh, you know, I don't like it, period. Because, you know, if I'm going to dig WWE, I remember when they did Orton versus Cena. <laughs> I'm like, oh my for the, god yeah for the love of god man split these guys apart like you know and it, it, it's just you know and it, it's lazy you know even if you weren't to do something where it's like you have one guy face a whole bunch of other teams before they face the same uh team again like say in uh, la right. okay i'm not get behind that you didn't beat everyone else but yeah i just i just kind of just wonder how much is is too much you know for some i mean if people are okay with it you know the ones that are okay with it that's cool you know but i just know for me it's just it's so much fatigue i and i just find myself looking at the rebellion card and just wish that you know somebody else was getting that opportunity right well you know i i know it also has to do with how much you're invested into the the person as well like Honestly, I'm looking forward to when we get Tessa versus Jordan part two. And then, you know, if it goes beyond that as well, just because I know what they're capable of. And, you know, it's something I'm looking forward to because I really enjoyed the first one. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you think about it, we just had one match and then they moved on. Like, I think yeah. when you do things like that, because I really thought. And and I hate that they went away with this, but I really thought a long drawn out feud between Tessa and Care would have been something because they already showed that they had something there, and you could have run the whole you know Tessa was a you know head you know above and beyond Care because Care was a young upstart. Like right. I felt like that was a story that you could have you know always revisited you know once Care got some stuff underneath. I mean some experience up underneath their belt, and then you fast forward now. I mean you couldn't even do that now because Care has kind of just been thrown in the whole undead realm thing. So um, yeah, it, it was just my thing. I was just thinking about when they yeah. had announced it because I was just saw like. Man, you know, I wonder if for fans, you know, and like I said, I seen on social media, some people were, you know, stoked for it. And look, I'm not criticizing that. If you're stoked for it, that's good. But I just wonder, I'm like, how many times can you see the same match before you're just tired of it? Yeah. And with, you know, the Lucha Brothers and LAX, not to take anything away from the guys. But again, it's similar spot after similar spot. And, you know, I'm honestly more of a fan of the old school wrestling where flips and everything are cool but you know i want to actually see something happening in the ring rather than people waiting around for somebody to hit a dive or something like that it just gets tiring <laughs> yep but that's it that's all i have to say um i don't know if you have anything else to add but if you guys haven't checked out the adam and rose show they have, are back um you can head over to the impact lounge to check that out um, you guys have another one set up soon? Yeah, um, for those of you who don't know, Adam lives on the other side of the world, so a lot of times the time uh, trying to get on the same time frame is kind of a what's difficult. I mean, the luxury with Keith is, you know, Keith is just three hours three hours ahead of me, so I'm able to gauge, gauge it. And I thank you, Keith, for being able to wait for me to wake up <laughs> every oh, Saturday. Good. 
you know, gives um, me a chance to watch. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we we should be back. Um, yeah, the the most recent one is up. It's mainly just a catch up show, and um, we were both sharing our thoughts. And you know, I just quick summary. I was just telling uh, Adam like how as far as 2019, I've kind of been down on the product. I mean, I found things that I've liked. But then, you know, more often than not, I kind of just really thought this year would be the year that they took off. And it just feels like another rebuild. 2.0. That's it. So I guess that's all we have for this week. Yeah, pretty much. There was no other news that came out or outside of the Alicia Tau. Yeah, no. It's just still amazing how much they're plugging this United We Stand show over uh, Rebellion, though. Got to find a way to pay... (laughs) rvd (laughs) that's it man all right i guess that is all for today thanks for checking out our show guys thanks for joining me once again ro and until next time don't forget to like share and subscribe thanks guys bye